Hi, I'm Josh again. You haven't met me yet. <laughs> uh, you might remember me from such presentations. Uh, so this one is cash all of the things. Uh, it, it, one of the great things about pods is that it can get you all all this really complicated data and make it, make it really easy. I mean, if you thought about how to do these bidirectional relationship fields yourself, I mean, unless you're like Scott who made this thing, um, most of us, it would just, you know, either we wouldn't know how to do it or we, it would make our heads start figuring out how to do it. And so that's one of the great things about pods. It hands to solve for us, but it's getting us a ton of data. And that means that we're making a ton of queries. And um, that cannot sometimes cannot be the most performant way of working. And so we need to have work workers. One of those is caching. And I always like to say, caching isn't always the solution, but it's a solution. And the proof is in the final results. You can, there's a lot of profiling tools, but the real check is, if, did I implement this cache system and my page load time went down noticeably? In which case, great. Um, so why cache? Because we can make it faster. Why not cache? Because it's more work than it, it more work, more queries than it's worth. Sometimes that's true. As I said, it's all about what, what's your final result. Also, we can use, and Scott and Phil are gonna get into this later, we can really optimize our queries and pods. By default, it's getting everything that we could possibly need. We can do an SQL select, uh, as select is a, is a parameter of pods fine, um, and sometimes that's the solution. But we're gonna talk about our caching options because in a lot of times, this is really what we need. Um, caching in general, um, in WordPress, we have three types of caching, object caching, uh, transient caching and file-based. Those are you know, your storage methods. Uh, object in, in, in the memory system, uh, whereas tra you know, transient storing to the database temporarily, and file-based is actually writing a file. Um, and then we also have these different sort of strategies. Full-page caching is what we're all most uh, used to. You know, bugging like W3 total cache will turn your whole page into an HTML file the first time you load it, and then the next time you load it, it just returns an HTML file. Um, and that's great in a lot of situations. Um, fragment caching is when we cache just part of a page, because some of the content is dynamic, some of it isn't. Um, object caching in the sense of pods object caching is when we're going to cache our pods objects. This is going to be a terminology confusion, because object caching is a technology that we use with, in PHP, like, you know, memcache, and memcached, uh, ABC, so on and so forth, like, pods object caching is built into the pods find method. Um, and then, we can act, the other thing that I'm gonna show at the end is sort of, is a way of using pods' as, um, pods as caching engine to cache function and method results. So I'll show you, here's a, here's a function that I need to use over and over again, and it takes a bunch of queries. So let's just do it once, and every other time return the cache version. Um, so let's start with caching pods objects. It's almost automatic. Um, the defaults to object caching, so there's a cache type parameter that we can pass into the, our pods find method, but if we just want to use the object cache, we just leave it there. We can change it to transient or site transient. Um, but the one thing that we do need to do is the expires argument. Expires is how long would be the maximum. It's not a guarantee, but the maximum amount of time to keep this cached uh, piece of data. By default, that's zero. Uh, so we can change it. WordPress, we can put in a number of seconds. Uh, I like to use WordPress defines these constants, day in seconds, minute in seconds, hour in seconds. Uh, they're just equal to the, whatever that number is. They've done the math for you. So, when we cache pods objects, uh, we have a, we have these three options. Object caching is the best option most of the time, but unless you have a persistent object cache, something like memcache, uh, and Scott's going to talk about setting this stuff up later, uh, it's it, it's storing in the current memory and then you do another page refresh and your memory's gone. Unless you have a persistent object cache in your back end, you're sort of defeating the point because you don't have it again on your next uh, object. The other thing is that <coughs> in our caching implementation for object cache, we can do group caching. So we can say, 
I'm going to cache these items in this group so I can clear only that group of when I need to, or clear the whole thing, or an individual key. This is more obvious. Transients uses the Transients API in, uh, in WordPress. It is an easy way to put a temporary piece of information in the database, but it still has to go to the database. Now, if you're talking about storing the result of 100 queries in one database query, there's an advantage there. But it doesn't have all, it's still with false going to the database supposed to object caching where it's in your working memory. Uh, site transient is also part of the transients API, but it's accessible to all sites on a multi-site network, whereas transients are tied to the current site. Um, pods view. Pods view is a class and then a bunch of uh, helper functions. Uh, and this is pods' caching system. If you trace back far enough from when you run pods fine, one of the things it does is check if that transient is, it, it, check if in pods view that uh, cached object exists. Um, but we can also use it as a front end tool for doing uh, fragment caching. Uh, things like, oh, I want to cache my sidebar, I want to cache my header, I want to cache this one section of the page that's always going to be the same, and then every time we calculate based on the current user a certain data. Um, because this is one of the big downsides of full page caching is what happens if some of your data is, deter is you know, you have a function that says get current user ID and then do all these things based on that. If you're doing static HTML page cache, you either have to not have that work for front if you logged in users, or you need to switch to a fragment cache. Um, one of the other good things about pods view is that it's tied into our save actions, so it's automatically handling the clearing of for you when you save pods uh, items or update your pod settings. So we have these really helpful uh, functions. Um, Pods, so there's there's a pattern, there's a whole bunch of them, but they're all in this get set get clear pattern. So set into the object cache, pods cache set, set into the transient cache, pods transient set. Um, and you'll note, and they're, these are very similar to um, transient set in WordPress, where we have key uh, value and expires. Uh, but there's a few cool things. One is that it's grouped in with pods. The other is that the, the set, the get ones, have a callback function as an argument. So you can potentially say, get this transient, right, get this key, and if that doesn't exist, automatically call a uh, function instead and return that result. The users call user function, right? Yep. Um, there's a issue out there where I said, hey, how come that we can't pass arrays to that? Arguments to that, and Scott's response was, "Yeah, you should write that." And, you know, I'll get to it. Um, so we also have, and there's a whole bunch of those for the different cache types. But we also have this sort of like uh, catch everything, pods view set, pods view get, pods view clear, and we have cache mode as an argument for that. So I can actually use this to store into transient or into cache or into site transient. Uh, the other ones are simpler, but maybe you're writing this in a plugin where it's variable which one you're going to use based on a conditional. So that allows you to use that. The other thing that these have that doesn't work uh, in transit works with object caching is group. So I can do a group and then when I do view clear, normally if I want to clear it, I use the key, just whatever the name of the, the cache value is, and delete it. But I can leave it, set that to true and pass in a group instead, and so I can clear all the ones that I put in that group without clearing anything else. Uh, and this is and this is a, a good example. So I use pods cache set four times, but two of them are in the key group one, two of them are in the group two. I can say I want to clear just the ones in group one, because I've set that as my group argument, or I want to clear just this one key. Um, and where this gets really cool is I can have a filter that's going to pass these arguments in and um, in here and say pause cache clear and then this pause name ID, right? So these are ones related only to that ID. I can do these sorts of things where I'm programmatically clearing certain groups. I can put these inside of my own actions. I can put these in other functions <laughs> in my code. Uh, 
so fragment caching, I touched on earlier, uh, this is more of a front-end trick, is these are perfect for dynamic sites, especially membership sites. Your static HTML uh, caching system is great for your blog, it's not great for your uh, membership uh, site. Um, and so, with this it allows us to do a couple of different things. It allows us to cache uh, query heavy parts of the site. You know, there's certain parts of your site that run a ton of queries, your sidebar. And there are other parts that are just, you know, basically get this post, get these fields. Those are pretty efficient things. Uh, this has a, all of our presentation will be up on, uh, on, si on slide deck. And this is an article that we wrote um, that has tons of code examples of how to implement this system in different situations. Um, and for that, we need to use this function pods view. Pods view is designed to function sort of like include or require work in PHP, but with way cooler stuff going on. Because, first off, view is, a, is expected to be a file path. Um, it is assumed to be in the child theme or child theme directory, but if you pass a full file path, it'll come from wherever. So if you just say the file name, it'll assume that's in the in your, in your theme directory, but if you do a full file path, it'll get it from wherever. Um, so these guys over here expires a cache mode. We talked about those before. We can set it to return or to e return instead of echo, which will do automatically as echo. And then the really cool one is data. Data is an array of variables to scope into the view. Uh, so this means that I can create a bunch of variables and then use them in another file, the one that's included by a pods view. So this means that I can set variables in the function and then use them in multiple different files. It means that I can clear out all of that logic from that file. And it also means that uh, it, it also means that those are only having to run when we're redoing the um, re reloading the cache. Um, so this is scoping data into a template part. Uh, this is an example. Um, if I wanted to write some some really clean markup where all I needed to do was echo a variable there, I didn't have to start with getting pods view or get post meta, I could use pods view. And what I do is I store, you know, I use pods display to store these two field values, post title and then the, the home plan that's post title. Um, yes, it's my Jedi pod again. Uh, I said it in all three talks. Um, and then we use the compact function, so PHP function that uh, allows you to make an array of names. And so then these are just the name of that variable, the name of that variable. Uh, and now, when I go into whatever file this is included, I can use name and I can use home plan. Oh, I just wanted to append that. Uh, a really cool thing you do here is if you are passing individual dynamic data uh, and it, you need to vary your cached thing that you're caching. So let's say you want to cache this really an extra special template file, but you want to pass different data into it, and you want that cached version to be different based off of maybe the user that's logged in, or uh, maybe the page they're on. You can actually pass additional information into this view variable as a hash. So you do pound sign and then whatever else after that. And it'll automatically handle uh, segmenting that out for you in the cache. So here's an example. Um, there's this uh, starter theme that it's support from, uh, from underscores. I pods uh, underscores s pods this. Like, what's the hopscotch in these pockets? Um, that I did. Um, it's up on our GitHub. But it's got a bunch of these types of functions that replace get you know get sidebar with this one. Um, and um, it uses this one is actually I did this so it would be designed to be used in any theme. So it says um, if function exists pods view then we use pods view to include our sidebar. So it's a system to cache our sidebar. Um, and if it didn't exist, then just use get sidebar. Uh, so it's sort of like you drop in replacement get sidebar. I do this a lot because you can't filter the name of the sidebar, so I end up doing this sort of stuff. I wrote a core patch for it, uh, it so don't blame me. Uh, the, here's another example of where we're using this. This, this code here, is going to get every item in this pod, right, this is a function, so it's defined dynamically, get every function, get every item, then for this field, get me the raw value and then get me the display value, and then return. And this happens to me a lot where I need to get every, every unique uh, option. 
uh, of a you know this field from this pod, and I need to use it multiple times. I need it to go on every page load, but it's not going to change that often, right? So that would mean every time I use it, I have to get this other pod object. I have to run through every item uh, and build this array. By doing my class, my method or function this way, what it's going to do is it says this key right here. The first thing it's to do is get that transient and then check if it's false. If it's false, run the code. Because if it's false, that means the transient isn't set. Um, and then at the end, cache it for next time. And then because when I did my conditional, I said items equals that transient, no matter what, I'm going to end up down here. I did an extra is set check on items, just in case. But there should be no situation in which it's not defined. It's either defined from the pods transient get, and then we skipped all this other stuff, or it's defined by building it. And it's going to return the same thing, but after the first time that I do this, it's going to skip what could potentially be hundreds of database queries. Uh, and so this is a great way on a code level to use this really easy class because I haven't put this in a group. So that means when I say pods items, this transient's gone. Which is great because this data is now invalid. And next time it runs, I can rerun it. If I wanted to be super slick, I could hook to our pods post save action all the possible uses of this function and have it rebuild. So that way it's slowing down my save in the back end but it's not slowing down for my front end usage, which is the point. And there is, there is one more thing. Uh, based off of that, what you just saw there, when you're pulling data out of the database, that's definitely useful, but if you're pulling data from a remote site, like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, definitely cache that in the same sort of way because uh, you could wait you know, five, 10 seconds sometimes for an API to finish, and I'll slow down the whole page. So if you cache it, even if it's for 15 seconds, 20 seconds, however long you need it to be cached for, it'll significantly impact how well your site will load on page to page for people. So yeah. definitely consider that. Uh, when you're pulling lots of, lots of data out, building it, doing lots of processing, <laughs> or when you're doing remote pulls, definitely those are two major uses there. Yeah, and I was going to say, this is a pattern, this is an example, but use this pattern. So the, uh, under the space of the function name, don't use that pattern. <laughs> the, uh, but. Use this, uh, you know, this is just, uh, you know, I kind of pasted, abstracted this from something that I was actually doing on a client site, and it's it's a really useful pattern for these sorts of things where you need a uh, computationally expensive thing or to cache the result from an API call. I mean, you could, I would, uh, all the example code where I showed you in the JSON API talk, getting from the REST API via the WordPress HTTP API, I would build this pattern into that in a real world example. So, have you tested how well this plays with like W3 or, or WP engines, uh, caching engines? Well, I don't. Because you would probably talk to that better. I, I, that I've tested how this plays caching. well with SiteGround's object cache implementation. Yeah. And the thumbs <laughs> up. It works perfectly because object because they give you the simplest way to set up a um, a persistent object cache. Right. I don't know how to do that. I, you could turn it, other than you turn it on inside Ground's uh, C panel, and then you t activate that one plugin so you can clear it easily. Yeah. Uh, and then it works perfectly. And then instead of using transient, transient's good, but it's not great. So it goes into the database, and they can get cleared weird. Um, having it, there's, that's nothing compared to having it in working memory, which is what the object cache gives. Right. Uh, so yeah, it, with site Ground, it works really well. Uh, you've so done for a WP engine. I've had ex extensive experience with that. Uh, there is usually no problem. However, if you have a significant amount of data you're storing their object cache, their settings are limited there. I believe it may be somewhere around 100, 128 megabytes total persistent cache you can have. So if you have a lot of users, uh, a lot of objects you want to store, you're going to hit that limit. And the problem ends up being that uh, Pods is optimized to use the object cache, so it will. But when you add your stuff, then you're going to hit the problem where all of a sudden you're adding maybe you know another 50 megabytes onto that on top of the limit, and so the object cache engine will chop off pods objects. So then the next page load, pods will have to run its own stuff to get all its objects again, and we'll have slowdowns. So uh, what we did for WP Engine was we implemented a, um, a thing called the pods alternate cache. It's a plugin on WordPress.org, and you can install that, and it basically stores all of the pods cache. 
completely separate from the normal object cache that uh, WP Engine offers. It's, uh, there's two options. It could be database-based or it could be file-based. Uh, file-based is perfectly fine. Um, the only problem there is that we also found another limitation where if a uh, user is not logged in, they can't actually have PHP writing, even if it's writing in for them in the, in the way we're trying to. So um, that's there's some give and takes there, but uh, certainly be aware of how much you're caching. Because like um, caching is great when you overuse it, especially on a host like the Engine. Uh, even some other hosts have that same similar problem. You're gonna have to scale up to a, a solution that will have a larger object cache available to you. And, and that's why I started with you. Know, these are this all sounds mm -hmm. good, and it's one of the options. But make sure you're testing your page load times, yeah. whether or not it's real or not. Uh, make sure you can turn do, turn it off and uh, see what happens. Use you know ping dom tools and get to that. Pods alternative cache is a great plugin uh, in certain situations. I always tell users try it. It may work. Test it. Um, and the other one is Scott wrote uh, Pods Ajax views. Uh, when you install that, it sort of hijacks pod, the Pods view function. It yeah. loads your pods views via Ajax. Yeah, so basically the pods Ajax views will, um, when you, you call the pods Ajax view function itself, but there's also an option where um, if you want, you can have all your pods views in your template load via Ajax, and it'll just automatically handle all that stuff for you. Um, so you load the page up, whoosh, all done, and then all of a sudden your Ajax stuff comes in. So it's, it can really produce a lot faster load times if you have a lot of different things you want to Ajax in. But uh, again, if you overuse it, then you have a bunch of little loading screen, uh, little loading icons all over the page, and then it, it can pr produce different effects depending on what you're using it for and how many people are using it. Um, but it's definitely it helps. Yeah. Uh, you had a couple of debug plugins that you want to mention to help people show, like what kind of object cache they're using. Oh, um, well, so the best, the best option for this is the. Uh, Object cache plugin for uh, add on for debug bar. If, if people here in your development aren't using debug bar, you should check this out. It's a free plugin. It's actually included, Automatic has their uh, developer plugin, which is a plugin installer for a bunch of other plugins. Uh, and one of those is the debug bar, and then it has all these extra add ons. So you can use that to check the contents of the object cache. It gives you that option. Uh, that's probably the most useful. So you use the debug bar. Plugin. And there's an add-on for it. Um, if, it for no, this is just general. But it'll check the op I mean, so all of this, all of our pods view, whatever, is wrapped around whatever whatever core technology then. So pods transient get is adding additional functionality on top of transient get, which is in the core transient API. And so if you chase back far enough, you're going to get to the you know, WP cache set. So it's, but what you don't get, right, so in some situations, it might just make more sense to use WP cache get, or set, or transient get, transient set. What you don't get there is the grouping that we have, and also the fact that it's tied into your pods update, right? So in the, I, in the example when I showed this one, I can rely on this not to present me with wrong with the, in, the incorrect data because right because I add a new value and now this transient is wrong. I can rely on this function to return correct results because this transient is getting flushed out as soon as I save pods items. <coughs> Any other questions? Great. Uh, so. Benjamin. Benjamin's on deck.